it's finally here in the sense that it's not quite here. The whiteout game is tomorrow, but this is our last BWI daily of the week. So I've got to say it's finally here. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. That's Ryan Snyder. We're talking about a big weekend, not only in recruiting, but also in Penn State football and a bunch of other stuff. And of course, we'll get to Ryan's best bets at the end of the show to give you an edge this weekend as Ryan begins his second career as a sharp as he transitions out of doing this and becomes a very rich person who lives in Vegas. That's the plan, right, Ryan? Nine and four, man. Hey, I'm off to a good start, at least. So <laughs> yeah, that's good. And this yeah, week was I, hard. I was trying to. I'll just say right off the bat. I mean, uh, I, I struggled to find a god again. I mean, we have uh, what is it, six games? But uh, this week was harder, I thought, than the, the other uh, two. So we'll see. We'll, let's let's keep it going. But um, let's talk recruiting first. Yeah, and and I gotta say, I've been following along with the picks <clears throat> and what we've talked about here. You've been on the money no pun intended, quite a bit. So if you're paying you're paying attention and you love to put your money down somewhere, Ryan's been doing a great job so far this year. And that's just one of the areas he's been doing a great job because obviously this is one of the biggest recruiting weekends of the year. And Ryan has got it all covered this week, bwi.rivals.com. If you aren't a member, you really have to be to get all the inside information, to get information that we can't release to the public that he gets and shares with members bwi.rivals.com backslash subscribe just give some of the inform give the the topics that you've been able to cover that maybe you can't give to us right now as a little tease for people to know what they're missing yeah well we're gonna we're gonna do a notebook a little later today uh just kind of hitting on how maybe the uh the new transfer rule and you know how guys going out impacts penn state's class moving forward uh, i fans probably saw this week that you know you can go over the 25 limit now or that's about to be uh official the NSA should make that official here soon and and how that is going to impact penn state's class you know i've been thinking uh 20 26 27 and eh, maybe be able to get to, to 28 or so now but you still have that 85 scholarship limit so we'll talk about that and uh just the inside um you know, just just what I'm hearing on you know the guys coming in for official visits this weekend. Of course, there's a ton of 2023 guys. We'll we'll hit on these guys here uh, publicly, but just kind of some more uh, inside in depth information on kind of what I'm thinking here as we we roll into Whiteout Weekend and uh, in the weeks ahead. So let's start with that uh, topic of the class because I checked out your recruiting list of all the guys that are going to be at the the visitor <clears throat> list for what's going to be at the Whiteout, and we've had this conversation a couple of times. You've talked about in August. The class of 2022 is basically done, and yet there are guys and, got, and and legitimate targets that are coming to this game. One of them is taking an official visit. So how does that work when you've got multiple guys and maybe only one slot left? How is Penn State balancing that when they're hosting those guys, but there's so few spots left? Well, you can never stop recruiting. You know, we've seen over the years, you, you have decommitments all the time. And if you if you say, hey, screw it. We're done in 2022. Let's focus everything on 2023. There's a good chance it'll it'll come to burn you at the end. Uh, do I see anybody who's about to decommit? No, uh, right. but you know Penn State's already had one with Tyrese Fairbury, and uh, you, you can't you can't just quit on that class. You know you got to keep going. And of course, like I said, you know with that with that new transfer rule, do I expect Penn State to get to 30 or something like that? No, but that may if everything falls uh, in line, it, it may help them a little bit. So. You know, this weekend, as far as uh, true 2022 official visits, uh, Jordan Allen's coming. He's the Penn State commit from Louisiana. He wasn't able to to take that visit uh, earlier this year. He, he had an official set and then had to cancel it, uh, just just had family things he had to do, so he wasn't able to make it. So that visit will take place this weekend, and, and this will actually be his first trip up here. So that, that'll be fun for him. Uh, but the three uncommitted guys, Amari Evans, six foot 170 uh, wide receiver out of Killian, Texas, Linebacker Jay Sean Barham, 6'3", 230 linebacker out of St. Francis in Baltimore. And then a, well, I didn't talk about this earlier in the week, but we're, we're going to talk about it now. Uh, an Arizona State commit, Larry Turner mm -hmm. Gooden, 6'1", 190 cornerback out of Mission Hills, California. I'll hit on, I'll start with, with Turner Gooden. He's committed to Arizona State, who obviously is under NCAA uh, investigation right now. Uh, their, their class is really kind of. Not not a good not a good place to be. Uh, you know, their class is pretty small right now. I think a lot of lot of recruits kind of have uh, you know concerns about what's going to happen there. And yeah, 
you know, he's, he's been open with their staff throughout that he, he wants to take more official visits. And, and I expect him to keep doing that here. Uh, even after this weekend, I know Texas, I believe is one he has set for, uh, you know, later this month, or I believe it's early, early October. And then Oregon and, and LSU or a couple other schools trying to get him on campus. So I, I wouldn't expect him to make a commitment this weekend or anything like that, but, uh, he's a very good relationship with Terry Smith. This has been going, going for a while now. Uh, I kind of just kept him quiet cause I didn't know if he was really going to make it and I didn't want to get fans excited about it. But you know, now that he's definitely coming, uh, it's, it's good to talk about, uh, Omari Evans, the, the wide receiver, <clears throat> he came up and just killed it, uh, for, for a private workout this year. And uh, I think he ran like a high, high four, three, something crazy, uh, 40 yeah. wise, like a four. Yeah. I love like, me some I've been speed. Saying a, I love me <laughs> some speed. Love, when I heard that, I was yeah. also interested. <laughs> and I'm not yeah, recruiting him. Yeah. <laughs> so Penn State, uh, you know, he had a great shuttle and just a great workout altogether. So that's that's really when he became a serious uh, contender for Penn State. Yeah. The, so he has a top seven or so, Arkansas, Baylor, Houston, Indiana, and then Rutgers and Vanderbilt. And those last two, Rutgers and Vanderbilt, uh, he took official visits to earlier in the year. That's why a lot of people kind of think they're the they're – the, main players in this along with Penn state, but mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's kind of, he, he's non-committal on whether he's going to take more official visits or not. I, and I mean, I, from what I understand, Arkansas and, and, and Indiana are both uh, interested in getting him on campus. So we'll, we'll see. He's also told me he wants to maybe commit at the end of September, which is obviously just, uh, you know, we're pretty much there. So yeah. let's see what happens there. I think Penn state would still have to talk about it a little bit if he wanted to commit and, um, you know, I, I think they would they would take him. But uh, at this stage, when you have really they have 25 kids committed because of uh, Spencer Rowland, the Harvard transfer. So, yeah, you know, yeah, when, yeah. when they're at the, when they're at their limit right now, they got to talk everything through. And uh, it's not like kid can just commit tomorrow and, you know, snap their fingers and it'd be done. So uh, whatever happens there kind of remains to be seen. But this visit should set Penn State up to potentially take him if, if everything goes well. And then linebacker Jay Sean Barham, you know, he's he's been someone we've been talking about forever. Penn State was after him since he was a freshman at the Matha. And of course, now he's at St. Francis. Another guy is kind of hard to read. I think he will stay close to home. Maryland and Penn State seem to be the favorites. Uh, but Florida and South Carolina are, are definitely pushing and, and would like to get him on campus. So this visit should set up Penn State pretty well with Barham. His family hasn't been here before. You know, it's, it's a full official. So he's going to get everything this weekend, uh, yeah, not just coming up for the game and going home. Uh, he'll, he'll be here through all out Sunday and and he'll get a lot of one on one time with the staff. So i uh, be curious to see how it works. I mean, out of those three, you know, Barham would seem to make the sense as the easiest take, you know, the 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 less you have to talk as a staff to figure that out. But yeah, uh, especially because I think Ido Carter could be a defensive end in the end. But, you know, we'll see. Like I said, man, when you're at that limit and you only have a handful of scholarships left, you, you got to talk it out and, and figure whether it's uh, the right thing to do now or maybe try and get guys to hold off for a little bit so you can figure out those numbers. And, and that's an interesting thing you bring up there at the end because I think Penn State, and I don't know if this is the chicken or, or the egg here, if Penn State's scheme is changing, so they're targeting more of those guys that could develop into def defensive ends but have some drop ability. We've seen Tar Burton and Zariah Fisher and Jesse Lucetta all morph into that role and see some of uh, that hybrid action. And then you got guys on the way that are true hybrids or that might develop into true hybrids. So I find that part pretty interesting. One thing I do want to ask you about, though, how does Penn State feel about their corner situation in the class of 2022? They have uh, Cam Miller, I, I think is his mm -hmm. name, from Florida. And then, of course, Jordan Allen, who's coming up for uh, his official visit. How secure is that duo? And would they add more at a position where... The old adage is you can never have enough corners. So is that something they would make an exception for at that position? Well, they're bringing good and Turner Gooden in for a reason. You know, they're, yeah. they're not going to use an official visit for someone that, you know, they, they wouldn't have serious interest in adding. So, yeah, I think I think it's definitely possible. But, you know, when you're also trying to fit an offensive lineman, Andre Roy, uh, you know, supposed to commit next week. Emil Wagner is going to be on campus for an unofficial this weekend. You're trying to add another defensive end. <laughs> you're trying to add a linebacker. Uh, of course, wide receiver, Mari Evans, Andre Green, Darius Clemens still out there. There's a there's, you know, a handful of positions that they'd love to add guys. Uh, but that's just that's where you got to talk it out as a staff and, and figure out, you know, the right plan of attack. So is it possible? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. You don't you don't bring him all the way across the country uh, just to just to say hello. Um, but this is a talk that they'll have to figure out. And I don't think we're going to have answers here soon. It's it's going to 
in an ideal world, Penn State would like all these guys to wait until uh, you know November and, and even closer to the early signing period, so they can they can really figure out who's going to leave then at the end of the season because yeah. that's going to yeah. play a major part in this as well. Yeah, and that's one thing that we've seen so far two games into the season, some of the usage at some of the high traffic positions. That's an interesting part about this, and, and I want to ask this question delicately, but when you look at what Penn State has coming in and you look at the situation right now, Nick Singleton, what he's done this offseason as far as adding to his body weight and to his lower body strength and turning into a super impressive running back, Given what's there already, can he play that early in his career? Because nobody on that roster right now outside of uh, maybe one or two players do you think is going to move on in any way, shape, or form? And you're bringing in two more running backs. I guess, how do you read that situation with, do you think he can contribute early in his career? Because he seems like from a physical standpoint, that doesn't seem to be an issue at all. No, definitely not. I mean, yeah, he definitely could. But it's more so of who's going to leave. You know, Catron Allen could definitely play early too. And, and Penn State yeah. has no issues uh, playing young running backs. So it's really more so of a question is, uh, you know, does, does Noah Kane uh, start start breaking out a little bit more and, you know, putting up some numbers and, and you know, have a reason to leave early? I think he's an NFL back, uh, but let's see. You know, he, he's – I think fans would like to see him a little bit more, but it's not necessarily on, on Noah so far either. So let's – this is kind of see how that progresses. But – uh, physically, I mean, Nick Singleton and Catron Allen are, are you know, as stout as you can get. Uh, you know, Nick also runs like a 4.5 and has a 4.2 shuttle. So, you know, we yeah. talk about <laughs> numbers and speed and power and, and that combination with everything and, of course, explosiveness. There's there's no questioning that that he could come in and, and handle, uh, you know, 20-plus 20, 20 carries. No, probably not, but I don't. I don't see why he couldn't be a a five ten carry player as a, as a freshman. Kevon Lee did it. I mean, and and you know, yeah. Kevon Lee's a, a heck of a player who was probably a little underrated. Uh, and and you know, Nick Singleton is very much uh, uh, in that mold. Rated. Better. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say right. Yeah, now he's, he's, pretty, he's even he's maybe. Yeah, I mean, rated. he is. Uh, I mean, he, I mean, Rivals has him in like one thirty ish, and uh, oh, you know, I oh think, my, I think. <laughs> I think he should be probably a, a top 100 back. I don't know about yeah. you know top top 40 or top 30, uh, but I I think uh, back half of that top 100 is probably fair. So we'll see where yeah, that, we'll see that's where my it goes. Bad. I I thought he was in the top 100 at this point, but mm-hmm. uh, if he's not, then yeah, 247 has him a little under. Yeah, 247 and on three both have him really high. Um, and you know, rivals Adam Freeman went out to see Nick last week, so that's a that's a good sign moving forward. He was excellent. Uh, we, you know, we just want to see Nick against some better competition, and that's not obviously on anything on him. So, you know, I know just from talking to my colleagues, you know, we're we're looking forward to to seeing him against uh, you know some 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 better teams in the playoffs. And actually, they're they rescheduled a game to play Harrisburg this week. Uh, I'll mm-hmm. say here on the podcast, uh, James Franklin's actually going to be at that game tonight. I wish I could go to that game. Uh, I have family coming to town, so so we're taking the weekend off after a lot of travel in the past couple of weeks. But uh, I will see Nick play. Uh, Joey Schlafler and Exeter Township here in a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to seeing the film from tonight, seeing the film in a couple of weeks. And of course, uh, you know, Governor Mifflin, to me, they're the favorites to win the 5A state championship this year. So he should go pretty far in the playoffs. It, it, and it's it's a, a lot of travel for you so far this season. One of the places you've, you've spent some time in Ohio, gone to see Drew Alar out there, uh, had a great article about him. Your interview with him was awesome. Another reason you should subscribe to Blue White Illustrated, bwi.rivals.com, or to the recruiting podcast that comes up every Tuesday, uh, Blue White Illustrated on YouTube, if you want to search that out. If you're not listening uh, to this show there right now, we're also on podcast, all that stuff. Hit subscribe. You know the deal. Help us grow the channel. Help us give you more of this stuff, this content on YouTube and where you get your podcasts. But you talked a lot about Drew Alar and the situation there and the I don't want to cover any of that this is my mailbag question for you because it's the one I've gotten over and over and over again you saw him in person you saw the 500 yards record setting uh day last weekend should you be rooting or should you want Drew Alar to start as a true freshman next year well I think you should be rooting for depth at that position and, and, you know, for the guys to be there to be ready, uh, you know, next season. So 
I don't think you ever want a freshman to be your starting quarterback, right? I mean, when you have yeah. guys on campus, Christian Bayou is a talented player. You know, Roberson, he hasn't gotten a ton of playing time. We've seen ups and downs and, and you know, practices and blue-white. Uh, well, it wasn't a blue-white game. It was an open practice we were saving this year. So, you know, jury's still kind of out there a little bit, I think. But in an ideal world, no, you definitely – I don't think right. you want uh, Drew Allard to be a freshman starting quarterback. I, I will also say that – uh, if Penn State doesn't pursue a, a quarterback in the transfer portal this year, I'd be pretty surprised. Uh, they, yeah. they wanted one last year, but they weren't going to risk, um, you know, losing Sean Clifford over that. And and the next year, I think you can, you know, as long as Sean moves on, which we expect him to, uh, you know, you can yeah. you can push maybe for a top guy. But no, I don't think you want a freshman starting. You definitely want to get him into into the program, give him, a, you know, two spring practices and a, and a fall to to get everything under his belt and go from there. Yeah, and and. So, you know, when you're in a conversation with somebody and they ask you something that seems like vague and weirdly out of the blue, it's just because they want to answer the question. So I mm -hmm. wanted to answer this question as well. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you're a Penn State fan, stop thinking that the next quarterback is always going to be Trevor Lawrence. Like that is so rare. And there's things you want to have. Drew Alar, get in, and I know he's going to be an early enrollee in, in the program. You want mm -hmm. him to be in and working with Mike Yersich as long as possible before he steps on the field from a mental, physical, developmental standpoint. That is what you want for him. If you have a true freshman starting for you, that is... You immediately are putting yourself behind the eight ball. For, it, it takes such a rare player. And I'm really impressed with his with Drew Allard's mental processing and the amount that is put on his shoulders in high school. You mentioned it. They, they run uh, an offense that's 90% him, 50 throws in a game. Between the yeah. 20s, it's 100% four and five wide receiver sets. So there's a lot on his plate. He is advanced from that perspective. But that's high school. If you if this program doesn't get a transfer or that you uh, Christian Veyu doesn't take that step forward or that competition doesn't mer uh, you know bear out a good player between him and Taquan Roberson, you're behind the eight ball. So stop yeah. rooting for that. Stop rooting for one of these two true freshman quarterbacks to come in and play immediately. That is not the ideal scenario. It's just yep. uh, you're betting on a one in a million chance and, and that you can you can know as much as you want about these guys. And we've watched a ton of film on them and it, the, the reality of them being that good and surprising all of us is just so low. So please, if you're if you're watching this, if you are within the sound of my voice, take that thought out of your brain and we'll all be <laughs> happier for it. Uh, I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you can, you I, can I, don't have a, I don't have a lot to add. I mean, the only thing I will just say is, um, you know, I still keep thinking people are overlooking Bo Cribula a good bit too. Me and Drew Alar. too. Yeah. And Drew Alar. I mean, I love Drew. I, I don't want to come off as like, oh, we're hyping Drew too much. And some, I mean, maybe to some degree we are just because, you know, I always feel like if we put too much on these guys' shoulders, sometimes you're kind of setting them up for failure. Because yep. I think a lot of Penn State fans right now expect them to be not Trevor Lawrence, but, you know, something that we haven't ever seen here, at least in a very long time. And, yep. uh, but, you know, Bo, Bo Perbula is just a winner, man. And, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, he's very athletic. Yes. He doesn't, doesn't have the, you know, the, quite the arm strength that people, you know, see in Alar. but, uh, we, we've seen many situations before where, uh, you know, the guy that everybody kind of overlooks ends up being a pretty damn good quarterback. Uh, and yep. Trace McSwirly is the most recent example. So just, yep. I'll never overlook a winner like Bo Perbula. So that's all. And I love I, I, I threw something up. I don't think it was his best game last weekend, but I was watching the film this morning when we were talking about the show just because I, I want to keep a fresh update of these guys. And I watched Drew, so I wanted to watch Bo. I'm really impressed with the uh, development in his footwork. He is a, mm -hmm. he is a very good, disciplined, fundamental quarterback. He makes quick decisions. He's everything you like if you're a talent evaluator like myself when you watch his film of what, what are his positional skills. I think he's very good from that aspect, and that is a huge part of playing quarterback. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the arm strength, the I, you know, he's got the quickness, he's, he's a good athlete, but you can't underrate those skills that are translatable from high school to college. You know, it may not be the big flashy things, but it is absolutely 
a huge part of the equation to me. And, and and I always like those guys that I feel confident in their ability to play the position from the ground up. So, uh, you know, I agree with you. Don't count out Bo Perbula. Yep. So I want to segue into one little thing here quick. Um, sure. I know we want to get into our mailbag, but I also wanted to hit on just a little bit of the 2023 visitors coming. This is such a huge list that yep. uh, I feel like we – we I can't give the whole list away, of course. We got to keep uh, some stuff behind the behind the premium uh, message boards and all that. But I have 51 scholarship uncommitted players confirmed for this, which I think is the most I've ever seen. Um, now – I'm I'm better at my job now compared to a couple years ago. Uh, I think I can I can uh, just source wise can confirm more players than you know the couple of first couple years of Franklin's tenure. But I believe this is probably the deepest whiteout list uh, we've ever seen. So I just wanted to kind of get that out there. You know, there's a lot of top guys. You know, uh, of course Matthias Barnwell was committed at one point. Yep. What happens there long term? Let's see. But just, I mean, I can roll through this list of guys. Rodney Gallagher is going to be up here. Uh, Christian Garrett's a top safety prospect from St. Francis. We haven't talked about him a ton. He actually came up this summer. Um, somebody to keep an eye on. I think he does have pretty serious interest. And then Penn State needs to get their foot in the door with St. Francis. I know fans are hoping it's next week with uh, Andre Roy. But uh, Nicholas Harbor is a guy I've talked about. I mean, he's. To me, I, I think he could be an Olympian sprinter uh, running that 10-31 out, at, uh, out in Oregon earlier this year. He's a tight end, defensive end prospect if he wants to play football, but that'll be something to watch moving forward. And uh, Luke Montgomery's probably their top offensive tackle prospect. He'll be there. Yeah. Lamont Payne, I've talked about Lamont for weeks now. You know, if somebody's on commitment watch this weekend, I think it should be uh, Lamont Payne. Actually, I, oh, we were going to talk about that. Sorry, I think I just gave it away. <laughs> but, uh, that's my fault. I'm rolling here, and uh, I, I kind of gave over that. Can but, I ask um, you one quick thing? Um, I yeah. know it, it, we're in the middle of football season, but with Rodney Gallagher, I know he's got two sport appeal. Where is that right now? Is there any update on that or just it's football season? So he's, he's focused on football. <clears throat> it's kind of like the Lonnie White situation, right? It's uh, yeah. James would always say it's football season. Lonnie's going to be a football player. It's baseball season. Lonnie wants to be a baseball player. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, yeah, you know, okay. uh, publicly, Rodney just keeps saying he wants to play both. Uh, Penn State, Pitt and West Virginia have made it fully you know, completely clear that they will allow him to play both. So from that perspective, I, I think that that helps those couple schools. But uh, it, it, he has obviously, what is it, you know, 14, 15 more months to go until he can sign. Yeah. So it's kind of one of those things where I think maybe next spring, uh, once he gets through, uh, you know, his high school basketball season and then, you know, kind of determines – because once you get to next spring, he's got to figure out, well, do you want to keep playing on the AAU circuit hard? Uh, which if it does, you know, that that tells me he's still very much involved with basketball. Or, or do you start maybe shifting and, and doing a little more seven on seven during the summer? Because that was one thing that this summer uh, he didn't get to do as much as, you yeah. know, a lot of these other top prospects because he was so focused on AAU. He's on Team Durant in, in Washington, D.C., which is, you know, uh, one of the best uh, EYBL teams out there. So there's, um, you know, we'll figure that out with time. But uh, just – Look, this is a this is a stack list for this weekend. One other player I confirmed just today was Joey Schlafler. He came up for Ball State last week. Uh, Michael Menich, younger brother, I think he's going to be somebody to watch this fall, maybe for a commitment. Not, I don't. I would be surprised if it's this weekend. I don't. I don't think that's um, coming now. But uh, you know, with him and his family ties, there's a reason Penn State waited for that offer because they wanted to make sure yeah. they were 100 percent in. And, you know, they, they knew that if they extended that offer, uh, there's a very good chance he may end up being an Italy Lion. So now is not really the time to watch for a commitment. I'd be surprised if it's this weekend. But in the in the weeks and months ahead, and they keep building more relationships, doing those Zoom talks, FaceTimes, all that good stuff, I think he might be somebody to keep an eye on. It's going to be a big, busy weekend. I know you'll be very busy at the Whiteout game, getting all the information, details, seeing what you can see from the Whiteout list. And I'll say it again for the third time today. If you want the full list, you want the information, if you love this stuff. And recruiting is something that when you get into it, you can get into it. And Ryan Spiral. gives you the information you need. <laughs> BWI.Rivals.com backslash subscribe. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, latest magazine is coming out pretty soon, so make sure you're looking out for that, and you can pick that up locally wherever you get your magazines, <clears throat> bwi.rivals.com and bluewhiteonline.com as well. Uh, are we ready to get into some mailbag stuff? Do you want to do that now? Yeah, let's roll, man. Let's do it. All right. So this is from Ryan Snyder's mailbag. Again, you can see that at Blue White Illustrated. We're just going to pick one or two questions from the list, and we're going to talk about them here. And if you want to see the rest of it and his answers to those, 
of course, you can get that at the site. Okay, so yep. this one's a little bit longer. Uh, how about a percentage of the current 2022 verbal commitments who actually plan to attend the whiteout game, especially those out-of-state commitments? Jordan Allen, as we've talked to get, uh, about already, is coming. He committed to that on Twitter. But three verbals, side-eye here from Florida. <laughs> they have not they have not had a verbal online that they're coming to the game and those would be the obvious ones that the farther away you are the more likely you are to decommit i'm now uh improving from at shadow 99's question but what about those three guys <laughs> from florida yeah they'll they'll all be here uh katron okay. allen zane durant and cam miller are all expected to be here uh so there are Technically, 25 committed players. As I said, you know, we, we always see 24 for the high school guys. But remember, Spencer Rowland is committed too, and that's uh, that's going to be an initial counter. So it's really kind of a class of 25. And uh, you know, Spencer's still playing for Harvard, so he won't be here this weekend. But uh, 21 of the 24 high school prospects uh, or junior college will. And the two junior college guys are actually part of the three who will not. Uh, Lackawanna has a game, I believe, in North Carolina this weekend. So obviously – I think it's at like one o'clock. So they're they're not going to make it back up here in time. I know those guys are bummed about it, but uh, they did get to the Ball State game last weekend. So that, that was good. And then Christian Driver is the only other person or the only other commit who uh, I don't believe is going to be here. I, I reached out to him to double check uh, earlier today on that and haven't heard back. But uh, just from talking to Penn State contacts, I don't believe he's expected here. So uh, it, it will be a healthy uh, group of the commits. I mean, this is basically – you know, they did their officials in June. Pretty much all of them came back for the Lash Bash. And, you know, after the Lash Bash, they were all saying this will be the next time that the, the group is together again. And, and that's yeah. how it's going to play out. So uh, this will be the first opportunity for the majority of the class to see a whiteout. But actually, I was going back through the 2019 list. Um, it was last night. And there were more players for that for that 2019 Michigan whiteout who committed than, than I originally um, realized. So it was Abdul Carter, Makai Flowers. Deny Dennis Sutton, that was Deny's first visit here, and was really his only visit for the longest period of time. Uh, Anthony Ivey, Caden Saunders, Nick Singleton, and Ken Talley. So what is that? Uh, eight guys? Seven guys? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven of the of the 21 commits um, you know, have seen a way out before, and of course the other 14 haven't. So it'll be a good experience for all those guys to get together. Jordan Allen's the only one taking his official visit, and that's pretty much because everybody else already did. And then, of course, Alex Birchmeyer is a 2023 20, commit, and uh, you know he won't be able to take it until next summer. So I want to ask the question behind the question, uh, which is, if you're insecure, if you should feel uneasy as a Penn State fan about one of these commitments that might decommit, um, is it one of those Florida guys, or is it somebody else that we don't really have on our radar? Well, Zane Durant's the only player so far who has taken a visit elsewhere. He attended, I believe, UCF's game against uh, Boise State to open the year. I think it was a Thursday night. He lives in Orlando, so it's kind of easy for him to make that trip. And then just from talking to people, I know Miami is trying to get him on campus. I have not confirmed if he's taken a visit yet. I don't think he has. Um, but just from talking to people at Penn State, they, they kind of give me the impression that they think he will take a visit to Miami at some point. So let's see, man. I, you know, I never like to – I get this out, you know, who's, who's the guy that most likely to decommit. And I always feel bad kind of throwing names just cause it's, yeah, you know, that's, that's, it's on the player to put that out there. Not me. I, I feel like, you know, loosely speculating on that stuff. Just kind of, I don't know. I feel they're, they're teenagers, man. They're high school kids. I, I always yeah. feel bad kind of doing that. So I try to stay away from it, but uh, you know, Zane is the one player so far, at least the only one that I've confirmed uh, that, that took a visit to another school so far this season. So he's coming back this weekend, though, and that's a great sign. He's paying his own way to get up here. Uh, fam, family will be coming with him. So let's let's see how it goes. Yep, and and you're right. That's a, that's a fair way. To, I'd say you handled that really well. That is a fair way to yeah. do that. Um, so the next question I, I, I want to uh, I want to get to, because we here on the Daily Edition, we talked about the James Franklin USC thing to death yesterday. We had we had a really good conversation with Nate I liked Bauer it a lot. about it. Um, and I thought it was a, a very, uh, you know, realistic conversation about everything that goes into that whole thing. So we're going to skip mm -hmm. that mailbag question. If you want to get Ryan's answer to it again, you can go to his full mailbag. I want to I, this one, I think, is kind of fun because it, it puts uh, something that I thought about into light other than the quarterbacks, other than LR and Bo, who is the most marketable 2020 recruit, 2022 recruit um, NIL wise. 
and mm -hmm. he asked which semi-local business should consider investing in them at Easy Dooley. But basically, not I don't care about the the business specifically, but which guys are the yeah. most marketable that are in this class? Yeah, so I, I spent way too much time on this. I went through everybody's Twitter and Instagram numbers to kind of try <laughs> and get a feel for that. My wife was questioning why I was going through all these Twitter numbers last night while I wasn't helping her with the kids. But this is why I do it for you guys. So, um, so long story short, Twitter wise and Instagram wise, Christian Driver uh, has the biggest uh, reach, and his Instagram numbers are crazy. I didn't realize that Christian Driver had almost fifty thousand Instagram followers, which is on a whole that's different a, level. Yeah, that's a ton. Uh, Keon Wiley's the, the next closest with 11,000. Uh, Caden Saunders has 11,000. And then Makai Flowers has, uh, all, he's approaching 10. And you know everybody underneath that has eight, seven, six, so on. Um, of course, Christian's dad is a former NFL player. So from that perspective, it grabs fans' attention. Then he had 40 scholarship offers too. So all of these you know, fans from all these different schools that offered him, uh, you know, started following. I'm sure that's a, a big reason why. But, you know, uh, social media numbers are a big part in this, at least early yeah. on they have been. And uh, I think he, <laughs> 40, almost 50,000, I, I think somebody would be pretty interested in that. So let's yeah. see. But but the thing I, the main thing I stress is, look, uh, whoever starts, you know, getting on the field and, you know, getting their name on ESPN and, you know, making big plays, they're going to see their, their, you know, their social media reach triple, you know, quadruple. Yeah. Uh, we'll see that, that this weekend for sure. Rocking. Somebody is going to yeah. get that sort of bump this particular mm -hmm. weekend with this particular game. So you're absolutely right about that. Exactly. Something interesting from, from a different side, the, the numbers are the hard numbers, right? So that is, mm -hmm. that is the tangible part. The intangible part of you've talked to most, if not all of these kids, and you have gotten a sense of their personality and that sort of intangibility that I like to think about when it comes to who's good on camera. Do you want to have mm -hmm. Patrick Mahomes in his first State Farm commercial? that sort of rough start or do you want to have somebody that naturally likes the camera like you and me sitting here looking all pretty on camera who are the guys that have the charisma that you think would be a really good marketer not just that they have the reach in social media who do you think would be the best on camera well definitely Caden is Caden Saunders is the first one that comes to mind and now it's a little unfair um, for me to not to the others and the reason I say Caden is because I got to spend you know a whole basically a day and a half with him in Atlanta this year for the mm -hmm. five-star challenge. So, you know, I've spent a lot of just, you know, that, that, um, off the record, you know, let's get to know you kind of, uh, I don't want to say buddy up time, but, you know, just kind of kicking it with him, uh, in a, in a laid back setting, uh, you know, the night before that camp, after that camp and all that stuff. So I, I just got to know him pretty well from that. And the, the big takeaway really was just how, how much he's respected by his peers. I mean, there are kids, mm -hmm all over the country who I didn't even know that they knew Caden Saunders, you know, there's kids down in Georgia and Texas and all over. And he played a good seven on seven. He played a couple of seven on seven tournaments with some big teams. I assume that's how I got to know him. But um, my point is he was really, you know, respected by his peers and uh, you know, that obviously these guys all play football. Uh, but I think a lot of, uh, you know, teenagers and 20 somethings uh, kind of uh, like his social media, you know, he, he's, he's, he's a fun personality. Yep. And I think, yeah, I, I think he's, he's comfortable in his own skin. This may be a good way to put it. So, you know, from a perspective of, you know, somebody who I think would be comfortable, uh, you know, getting out there or doing a podcast or, you know, doing a commercial, whatever it is, uh, Caden really comes to mind. So, uh, but again, you know, a lot of these other guys I haven't gotten to spend that time with. So I'm sure there's a couple others who kind of float under the radar, um, you know, that, you know, in the years to come, we'll, we'll really get to know their personalities more. I, you know, I do interviews with them and stuff and, uh, you know, we chat uh, and, and text and, you know, do things that, uh, you know, aren't just football talk all the time, but to, to spend, you know, a day and a half with Caden in Atlanta, that's just kind of a, you know, to, to really get to know the guy. It's just that was something that really stood out to me, and I think he'd be pretty good at it moving forward. And, oh, by the way, I think he's going to be a pretty damn good player too, so that that's going to yep. help. Yep, and and I, I one of the things I think I texted you this after I watched one of your interviews with him and then when, uh, when I saw his play, 
it, the KJ Hamler vibe is palpable of a guy who's charismatic. Mm -hmm. He's going to be good on camera and he's going to produce. And that's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, another guy that I think has a, a, you know, another receiver and you kind of think of these guys because they get the ball and then they tell you about it. Anthony Ivy. I don't know him as well, but I, mm -hmm. his play on the field has a certain swagger and confidence about him. So I could see that being another one in my mind of guys who, I'm watching everything on the field, you know, so that's one of those guys mm -hmm. that has that sort of um, magnetic sort of feel about him when he's on the field. Uh, let's move on because we've got to get the people what they need for this weekend because we're drawn on here on a Friday, depending on when you're listening to it. You need to get all your money in. So we are going to do Ryan Snyder's best bets. Have yeah. this one on this list. Are you saying that that Ohio State is going to cover in that gigantic gap because of the loss last week? Yeah, well, the the actual spread is, is I believe, like 26 and a half or so. I'm going to stay away from, from that because I think in the second half, maybe they could, uh, you know, put, put the backups in and, and take it easy. I, what I like here is first half minus 14 for Ohio State, and I like first quarter minus seven. I expect Penn, Ohio State's defense to come out and play really strong against a Tulsa team that I don't think is very good. Uh, they lost to an FCS school. Uh, they, they lost to Oklahoma State, too. And I don't think Oklahoma State's very good. We'll talk about them here in a minute. But uh, I don't know, man. I, I just I, – this is a good spot for the Buckeyes, I think. Uh, the, the, you know, their defense has been – Talked poorly on all week, we'll say. And, uh, you know, I expect them to come out and, you know, really, really play strong against Tulsa. It's at home. Uh, if they're not up by at least a touchdown in, in, in the first quarter, something is very wrong with this team. So I, I feel like this, at least that first quarter bet, is a push or a win to me, it feels like. Uh, and, you know, if Ohio State's not up 21 or so, uh, to end, then in halftime, then, you know, it's kind of the same thing. I feel like there's something wrong with this team. So give me uh, Ohio State minus 14 for the first half. And I like uh, minus seven for the first quarter as well. What was your feeling on the Ohio State game? Did you watch it last weekend? And what did you take away from that game in particular about Ohio State kind of as maybe an early scouting report here? Well, honestly, I didn't get to watch it a ton. I, you know, Penn State played at 3.30, and I have to get to the stadium to get recruiting photos and whatnot. Uh, so I'd be lying if I said I got to watch it a lot. I know uh, their defense struggled with, like, the same play over and over yes. again towards the yes, end zone. Do. I heard about that. They have that no bit. idea. They have no like idea how to right. contain. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about that. But, I mean, I was at Beaver Stadium uh, you know, I, I got to watch maybe the first quarter and, you know, then I'm getting ready to go. I'm at Beaver Stadium pretty much by halftime for that game. And then for the whole second half, I'm down, you know, near the field trying to get recruiting photos and just kind of getting ready for Penn State. So that's the the gift and the curse of, of this. You know, you get into college, you, do, you cover college football because you love college football. Uh, but then you learn, oh, wait, I only really get to really focus on one game a year. I like it or one game a week. Uh, I'm happy that it's Penn State. You know, I, I enjoy covering Penn State, but uh, until until your day's over with, um, you know, there, there's there, you just you can't focus on anything else. I see a lot of Pac-12 after dark, but that's about it. <laughs> Which is uh, both a blessing and a curse, because you know, yeah. Pac-12 after dark <laughs> that can go a lot of different ways. Sometimes the sometimes they're great. You know, uh, yeah. The degenerate in me sometimes watches a little Hawaii. You know, 12:30 starts. Uh, if I'm up late, I'll I'll put them on. But uh, you know, I, I follow it very closely. But to be able to really focus and watch these games. Uh, of course, when Penn State's on the road, I'll, I'll get the opportunity a little bit. But I'm also a lot of Saturdays. I'm going out to watch high school games. So uh, I, I wish I got to watch college football more. I'm looking forward to Penn State's bye week. It'll be the one week where I don't go anywhere and I just binge on the couch and have a good time. So if you're watching here on the YouTube channel, uh, Blue White Illustrated on YouTube, thanks for sticking with us. There's some fun stuff going on with my computer right now, but thankfully the audio is super clean. So if, if you're if you're watching this right now and uh, you're you're sticking with us, thank you. But there's also the podcast version. Uh, trying to get a couple things done here to make that better. But let's go into another game because we always have to get some Mac vibes from you, Coastal <laughs> Carolina and Buffalo. And uh, I think this is a 14-point spread here. What What's going on in this game that you like? Uh, I'm staying away from the spread, man. I just like the over. Uh, okay. Listen, Coastal Carolina put up 52 points and 49 points in the first two games. Uh, their second game was against at Kansas. Yeah, I know Kansas stinks. But they allow Kansas to score three touchdowns. 
I think, you know, Buffalo struggled last week with Nebraska. I actually took Buffalo. That was one of my losses last week, getting 14 against Nebraska. But I, I, I listen, I absolutely think that this is a game where, you know, Carolina, you know, Coastal Carolina can can reach the high 30s, low 40s, and Buffalo, you know, gets into the 20s somewhere. Uh, and, and this spreads 58, you know, to me. Just from talking to like, I, I like to follow people who do, you know, power rankings and whatnot. And a lot of a lot of people who, who really kind of do this professionally uh, think that this over should be closer to 62, 63. Uh, and whenever you have a five point gap there and some power rankings in the spread, I, I'll always, you know, follow, follow some of these guys who do this power ranking stuff. So, yeah, long story short, I think this number is too low. I think Buffalo can get uh, well into the 20s, maybe 24 or so. Uh, and Coastal Carolina can get well into the 30s. I, I I like the over 58. So the, I, I always am a little bit leery of like a Mac team. Appalachian state is another one where they had a really good coach and then the coach moves on. They still have the talent, mm -hmm. but what made that team so good was the combination of the talent and the coaching. And you, you can't always be uh, guaranteed. You're going to hit on the coach the next year. And that, that is at the power five level as well, but it can be really uh, exacerbated at that Mac level. So I think, I think you, you make a good point here. Stanford at, uh, I think Stanford is at Vanderbilt is in this one. Is that correct? correct. Yeah. So yep. what, what do you see here? Uh, Stanford. I'll, I'll, I'll lay 12 with Stanford. Vanderbilt stinks. They're, they're not a good football team this year, man. And look, yeah. we, we saw, this is pretty simple to me. Stanford played the wrong quarterback that first week. And then they brought in Tanner McKee. who was a pretty high ranked quarterback back in the day. I mean, I think he, he, uh, you know, he had offers from some top schools and decided he wanted to go to Stanford, get a good education, which, man, you got to respect that. Yeah. And, dude, he lit up USC last week. That was one of the few games I did get to see a little bit of last week. And uh, I, I was really impressed. So uh, give me Stanford minus 12. This one's, I would say, out of my plays this week, this is the one I'm least uh, confident in, I would say. Uh, but, um, you know, this is more so just I don't have any faith in Vanderbilt. So I'll, I'll lay 12. That's a big number on the road. Uh, for a Stanford team that's been very hit and miss at times, and obviously they just played probably the, what's going to end up being their best game of the season last week. But I, I what I saw from Tanner McKee last week shows me that this guy could uh, can really throw it. And David Shaw seems like he wants to throw it a lot more now too, which is good. Uh, yeah. You know, Stanford's had a suspect of line for a while now, so they might not have a choice. But yeah, I, I, this is more so just a. I don't have any faith in Vanderbilt being a good program this year. I think Stanford got some confidence last week. They look like they may have a quarterback now. I think they can they can lay twelve. I actually like the first half here a little bit more too, but I went with uh, with just the minus twelve full game for for this play. So for the next one, Colorado State and Toledo. Colorado State at Toledo, and they're an underdog in this game, and I was a little surprised by that. Tell me why I shouldn't oh, be dude. surprised by that. You should not be surprised. Toledo's. I awesome. haven't kept up. Yeah, I haven't kept attention. up with uh, Colorado State at all, probably since Michael. They're Gallagher. terrible. They <laughs> lost to an FCS. To they do they got smoked by. So like North Dakota State, maybe or somebody in their first game. Listen, okay. Oh, an here, elite FCS school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, listen. Long story short, uh, I think Toledo is the best team in the MAC. I had them last week against Notre Dame. That was a winner, uh, and I and I talked about it a couple weeks ago in this segment. I think uh, I actually have a, a season win total for Toledo to win. I believe it's over eight eight and a half this year. I think it is. I like Toledo a lot. They're they have a handful of NFL players on their team, and. Uh, Colorado State is not good, man. Uh, they're going to be without a couple key players, too. They have – I know they're leading tacklers out this week, from what I read. They're missing two of their other top defensive players for the first half uh, due to targeting calls last week. And now their um, second-best receiver is probably going to be questionable as well. Uh, I think Steve Adazio is the head coach at Colorado State now. What has Steve Adazio ever done? Like, I, I'm just not, not very – I don't see that program going in the right direction at all. I think this is going to be one of the best seasons Toledo's ever had. Uh, so, yeah, I will gladly lay 13 and a half. I, I, think, I think what I'm going to do is my like pick pick, though, is maybe do minus seven and a half first half uh, because there are a couple key players for Colorado State who are out due to targeting calls. So uh, we'll do the official play will be minus seven and a half first half. Uh, but I like 13 and a half for the full game, too, if that's what you want to play. Here's Ryan Snyder's best bets here with you on our Friday. The next game that I want to talk about is uh, one, and this transitions perfectly into our marquee game of the weekend, Oklahoma State and Boise State, seen as two of the biggest names in this game. 
Uh, Mike Yersich used to coach at Oklahoma State as the offensive coordinator, and Brian Harson last year was the head coach at Boise State. So this is a good transition mm-hmm. into our next game. What are you seeing in this game? Uh, this one is ca- the Oklahoma State's on the road, and they're pulling yeah. three and a half, I think, right? Yeah, they're, they're get yeah. So Boise State's yeah. giving three and a half. Yeah. Oklahoma State's getting. Well, so I actually have this at minus three, um, and that's where I, I I did play this earlier in the week. Uh, I like Hank Bachmeyer. I think he's a good quarterback. He's he's thrown for I believe it's like 600 yards or something like that last week or maybe the week before. I mean he's put up some pretty good stats so far. And as I said earlier, um, you know when we were talking about the the Tulsa Ohio State game, I I just don't think Ohio, Oklahoma State's a very good team. Um, you know, going up to Boise, man, Boise's going to be pumped for this game. They got a, a, a P5 school coming up there. That that doesn't happen very often. And, uh, you know, I, I just – I like Boise State here. I think they're going to be a quality team this year that can, you know, that can put up some, some, some good wins. They had a tough one with UCF, but – uh, I think I think they're going to rally and, and have a good season. So I, I will happily lay three points here with with Oklahoma State on the road. Um, I think Boise gets it done on the blue turf. And w- do you know the story there? What Oklahoma State's doing going to Boise? Because that is one thing that that when I looked at this, I was like, because when I was making the graphic that I'm trying to get you right now, I was a little surprised by that <laughs> that they were on the road. Uh, is this just another weird I conference I, thing? I, I assume it was on? just. I assume it's just a one and one, you know, yeah. uh, you know, home and home. I, I, I don't follow Oklahoma State and Boise State schedules too much, so I'm not sure. Yeah. But you it's know, maybe it was. Weird. It could have been a, yeah, it could have been a two for one. You know, maybe, uh, maybe Oklahoma State's getting two two home games out of it. But Boise State's a respect enough program now. I don't think they have to do that. So I think it's just a, a yeah. home and home. That's what I assume. All right, so the game of the day that we're going to get to here on Ryan Snyder's Best Bets, the whiteout game. It is the primetime game here. Um, uh, ABC, ESPN, 730. What are you seeing here with Penn State? Uh, they're minus five coming into the game, so a little bit more than just the field goal advantage for home. What are you seeing in this game that you like? Yeah, well, look, if you're a Penn State fan, be patient because this line keeps going down, and that's what you want. Uh, people are people taking quite a bit. Um, uh, Auburn uh, getting the points, and and that's fine. I, I will I will take Penn State. Uh, I'm gonna wait and see if it gets the four and a half because I really like it. If I would love it if it got the four, uh, I don't. I'd be surprised if it got the four, but I, I think it could still drop the four and a half. This line's was just going down all week. Everybody's taking the points. The the other bet I think I like is the under fifty three, and I'm yeah. torn here on which one to lean towards. So. I'll, I'll for official play. I'll go Penn State minus five, um, but man, I really kind of like that under two. So if, if you if you if you think um, you know the Penn State defense is going to play well, which I do, and I think Auburn's defense is going to play well too. I think Auburn's defense is going to prove to be better than Wisconsin's defense. Yeah. So I, I could see this definitely being um, under fifty three. I'm, I'm torn. I, I know I'm going to say you know my official play should be Penn State minus five, and then we're going to have like a you know, 21, 17 game. And I'm just going to miss covering it. I'm going to take a loss for the weekend and, and you know, the under is going to come in easily or it'll be the opposite then and go way over. So official play we will do minus five, but man, I really like that under. So uh, if, if, if you're comfortable with that, take the under. Here's one that I, I feel like I can be confident in talking to you about uh, because yeah, I don't follow Boise state or Oklahoma state at all, uh, but I've watched <laughs> a lot of film on these two teams and to me you're right with that under i really think this is going to be a defensive battle because uh auburn's got a really good defense the difference between them and wisconsin is they actually have a secondary like their secondary Mm -hmm. is good and Mm -hmm. you know Jahan dotson parker washington they could get open they could get big plays I i will say i can see this going one of three ways it can be a blowout either way or it can be a very low scoring game but yeah, I think mm-hmm. the under is the play here because these defenses are coming to play. And if it is a blowout, one of these quarterbacks completely had a nuclear meltdown in prime mm-hmm. time. It's not going to be that I, I just don't see a bunch of big plays with these two teams on the football field. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that under. And, uh, you know, they're very close teams. You're right. Uh, I think you're, you're right on that with you want this as close to a field goal as possible because I don't see – a gigantic difference between either of these two teams on the football field. Yep. Yeah. I mean, like I said, so we'll, we'll roll through them again. Um, yeah. So Ohio state minus 14 first half or minus seven first quarter. Uh, I'll probably play them both. If I, if I was you, I, I like them. I, I think you can double up on this game, man. Uh, I expect Ohio state to come out and, and, 
kick butt, we'll say, <laughs> in that first quarter. <laughs> uh, yeah. Long story short. Um, so I'll, I'll just roll through these real quick. I'm sorry. Uh, over 58, Coastal Carolina, Buffalo. Coastal Carolina's put up a ton of points this year. I I, I think that they can put up, like I said, 40 or so. And, and Buffalo should be able to, to get well into the 20s. I think that number should be closer to 63. So I like that over. Stanford minus 12. I think Vanderbilt stinks. We'll just leave it at that. Boise State minus 3. I think Oklahoma stinks. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Uh, and especially, I think, Boise State, man, they're going to be pumped to have a P5 school coming to their school. So that they should play well. I think Toledo is the best team in the MAC this year. Uh, minus 7.5 first half and minus 13 for for Colorado State, I'll lean minus seven and a half for, uh, first half is like the official official play, and then I think I'm going to take Penn State minus five for the official play in the Penn State Auburn game. But man, I really like that under two. So uh, yeah. either one of those are pretty good. I, I, you, I, Penn State should win this game by seven, but I could also see it, you know, being a pretty low scoring game. Okay, there you have it. That is Ryan Snyder's best bets for this week, and that's going to do it here for the BWI Daily Edition on Friday. By the way, if you want to make sure that you know what happened during the game, the post-game show coming up 15 minutes after the game, BWI Live, myself and Tom Hannafin, will be taking you through Penn State versus Auburn. It's the whiteout game tomorrow night. So tune in, subscribe, make sure wherever you get your YouTube shows, you know, YouTube, you can go there and you can subscribe <laughs> wherever you get your podcasts, you know, podcast. wherever you get your podcasts. I've only done this every single day since July. You think I would be nailing it right now. Anyway, subscribe wherever you get any of your things, wherever you like to consume your media. We'll be there peeking around the corner saying hello. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. He is Ryan Snyder, and we'll talk to you again next week.